that's the highest number of sharp cubes, sharp cubes and sharp channels. You can see it in one place. Okay? So you don't get that opportunity. Okay, to please visit on uh, Friday, make it a point. They'll take you through uh, the entire lab. The people, students will be there to explain to you. Okay. Now, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on explaining what a shock wave is. Basically, we call shock waves are non-linear waves. So they uh, always propagate at supersonic speeds. So that's an important one. Then they normally occur at transonic and supersonic flows. As an aerospace engineer, you'll be knowing it. And they also occur during uh, explosions, earthquakes, hydraulic jumps, lightning strokes, so on and so forth. Okay. I have two profiles here. One is the shock wave profile, what we normally call. <coughs> other one is a blast wave profile. So if we just see the difference between these two, a shock wave profile has a longer duration uh, of a higher, the larger pressure, that is what we normally call peak over pressure. Whereas the shock profile, it reaches a higher pressure, peak over pressure then it attenuates much faster or there is an exponential drop in pressure. What determines <coughs> generation of shock waves, the different types of shock waves you generate or what you call the blast wave is this time, okay. So this time, what you have makes what you call it as a shock or a blast wave, okay. So generally the rise time, I have written it as vertical here. So instantaneously it's supposed to have, but in reality it will not have, it's basically from this point to this point, the rise time approximately in a uh, normal shock tube, maybe around 10 to 30 microseconds. Okay, that's what you normally get, depending on the shock tube you have. In a blast wave, this reduces to one to two microseconds, or a maximum of microsecond, five microseconds. Okay? So that means the difference in a shock wave and a blast wave is the rise time is one, which is much more slow in the case of a shock wave compared to blast wave. The other is, the time duration for which the pressure loss logs is typically around 40 or 50 microseconds. It can go up to 100 microseconds, okay, this one. So whereas here, it instantaneously starts falling. So we call this as a Freelander wave. If you have it in the next slide, so this is what is a, a typical uh, blast wave what we have. So normally a shock wave which decays immediately after it reaches a peak, we call it as a blast wave, okay. So the decay, rate of decay, is different for different parameters like pressure, density, and material velocity. In the sense, you see the similar profiles, but the rate at which this decay happens, that is the positive phase, what we normally call, so this is for the pressure. Similar, you can see it for density and also for velocity. Okay. The other uh, distinguished between shock and a blast wave is the negative phase. Okay. So this is suppose, this is atmospheric pressure, P0, and this is what we call a peak over pressure, okay. And it goes below the atmospheric pressure, so we call a negative impulse, okay. So basically you can calculate the pressure, it's called a Freelander wave. So by this formula, where T by T aspect, T aspect is basically the duration of the positive, uh, the positive phase of this. So you can calculate pressure at any point, and if some pressure profile matches with this, we call that as a blast wave, okay. So that's the simplest way to, uh, check whether your profile, what you got from your uh, shock uh, generation method is a blast wave or a shock wave. You can always calculate and I'll show you some examples also what we have done. Okay. Now what are the different media in which shock waves occur, blast waves occur? Gases, liquids and solids. And of course you also have shock waves in space. I didn't include much slides on that. I just don't want to get in because it's totally a different a different phenomena actually, okay. It doesn't follow the same uh, loss as what you normally get for gases, liquids and solids, okay. Somebody is keen, so we'll see. It's I am also not an expert on that, but it's an interesting and a very uh, challenging phenomena to understand, okay. Because we always say you require a medium for propagation of a shock, okay. So this is the, where are the shock waves occur? So anyway, you have supersonic flows, external flows, you have supersonic. Then this is a uh, supersonic flows in a inside a liquid. These two are liquids, okay, what you have. So this is the liquid inside which you have a shock wave. So this is actually a bubble collapse uh, in a liquid, okay. So you have cavitation bubbles collapse. So you get a shock wave coming into picture. And of course, this is a shock wave in space where you have this is the earth. Uh, you get a bow shock in front of the magnetosphere. 
by solar winds. Okay. So the thickness of the shock wave in the air is an order of 10 power minus 7 uh, meters, uh, whereas uh, in space it can stretch up to few hundred kilometers. Okay. So that's how, because uh, basically here what happens is the solar wind, which consists of photons, okay, so will slow down from uh, their velocities, they become subsonic. So then you have accumulation of all these um, particles, okay, solar wind particles where the density becomes large, okay. I think Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 passed through this, so where they were able to measure the density variation of um, across the shock when they passed our solar system, okay. So if you want, you can just read those articles, they are able to measure the density variation and the density variation is very large, okay, very large, okay, of course. Uh, the density there is what? Zero. You have 10 power, uh, how many, uh, 10 power minus 10 particles in one cubic centimeters, okay. I think minus 20, okay, in a one cubic centimeter area. So it came down to, I think, 10 power minus 4, okay. So some, somewhere around 10 power minus 15 to 10 power minus 4 itself is what? A variation of order of 10 power uh, 8 or something, isn't it? So that's a density increase, okay. So that still it's very, very less, okay, right, 10 power minus 3 particles in a centimeter cube also is very less, but there is a huge density gradient, okay, so what we are interested in is how much the density variation per unit area or per unit length, okay. Of course, you have seen this uh, yesterday's, uh, I think the first days, I think Jagdish would have given you this from this presentation, so the shock waves are there everywhere, we have seen already shock waves in material science yesterday evening. So we had at the first day shock waves in biomedical research, okay. Then we had shock waves in high temperature physics. Um, uh, Professor um, Arunan dealt with these two shock waves in chemical kinetics. Okay. Other than that, there are uh, plenty of other applications. Some of these applications and uh, various industries will be dealt by Dr. Chintu in the afternoon. And uh, of course, we are not getting into this. This is a totally different area. Okay. So then we have, uh, um, Actually, we did start uh, walks on, uh, not on internet traffic, we did start an interesting walk on uh, how people behave when you have a shock, okay. So we had an experiment, uh, we conducted experiment in uh, Brigade Road, I think you know, isn't it? So we, at that time, I think it was 15 years back, there are not much of these uh, safety concerns, so we were able to go onto the top of a building and sh keep, keep a camera, and see how people behave suddenly if somebody comes in between you, okay. So that was required to design the exits of any auditorium. So when there is a sudden explosion or a panic, okay, panic. So we have, I, I just, sometimes if you want, I'll show you those videos also. We couldn't go beyond that because it was becoming difficult to do experimental uh, work, taking police permissions, okay, right. Some of them allowed us for one day. So beyond that, they were not allowing us to, do these experiments on people. Okay. So we stopped that walk. Okay. So that's an interest, interesting walk on internet traffic. We just Google it, you'll get a lot of papers on shockwave. Basically, they use gas dynamic principles to study how internet traffic works. Okay. So that's what is uh, the connection. Okay. So then these are some of the earliest uh, uh, industrial applications of shockwaves. So these are all. Um, uh, components which have been done by using shockwaves. Yesterday, Satyam Suhas was telling about material applications. Okay, all these were done using actually shockwaves. Okay, or blast waves, basically. Okay, I think uh, you all know about Mach number. Okay, so I don't want. I just uh, included this slide because I want uh, you to get an idea of. So, what is the speed of sound in different medium? And we all know that you get a shock only when you have supersonic. Uh, velocity. So that means the speed of uh, the speed should be more than the speed of sound. Okay. So if you want to create a shock in an air at 40 degrees, so what you require is something should be moving more than 355 meters per second. It becomes supersonic. You get a shock. Same thing. If you want to get a create a shock in aluminium, that should be moving more than 6.3 kilometers per hour, sorry, kilometers per second. Then only I can create a shock wave in a Solid, okay, solid. In a liquid like water, so 1.4 kilometers per hour, sorry, kilometers per second is the speed with which I should release energy or push something, a torpedo which moves 
with 1450 meters per second more than that can create a shock wave inside the water in front of it okay so this is very important so it looks very I mean it's easy to create a shock in air compared to water or compared to metals okay but of all the things uh, the shock wave research in air and gases has just progressed a lot similarly shock wave research in solids has progressed a lot actually okay so but somehow the shock waves in liquids is one which phenomena which is very difficult to understand it's not much work has been done okay Sir, within a solid like a metal or something like gold and uh, lead, you can't exactly see how the shock is propagating within it. Yeah, we, so. we now, normally, uh, what happens in a, a, a solid medium is a shock wave turns into a stress wave, okay. So basically a shock wave becomes a stress wave very fast because it attenuates fast, okay. So in a sense, for you to move a push a shock for a longer duration, you require a lot of energy to do that, okay. So in a solid, after initial few, you now if I tap this, Actually, I have created a shock, okay. but how long it has lasted, but what is the depth to which it has lasted, it's just negligible, okay, negligible. Any small release of energy, it always creates that, but for you to drive, let's say, one of them inside your uh, material, you require enormous of energy, okay. What it happens is, basically, it attenuates and becomes a stress wave, okay. So, basically, if you study shock waves in solids, what you will be studying is stress waves, rather than actually uh, shock waves, okay, right, because they become fast they attenuate into what? Stress waves and attenuate much much faster. So attenuation means decrease in their amplitude as well as velocity. Well, well some of water it's been a very difficult uh, medium to understand shock waves simply because we all know that behind a shock you have a lot of pressures and temperatures then cavitation comes into picture so you don't have one medium okay so now you have what? a two-phase mixture in liquids that's a one reason why uh, the research in shock wave uh, propagation in liquids is not uh, so much understood compared to solids or uh, gases. Okay. It's fundamentally because of that. Okay. So anyway, for aluminium or copper for it to uh, change its phase, you require enormous amount of energy to change its phase. So we normally, you don't, will not be able to create that kind of a facility in kind, inside the lab. There are very few places in the world where they create such kind of a like 1000 atmosphere or 2000 atmosphere pressure. It's difficult to create in a laboratory setup. Okay. Basically, uh, uh, I think you all know those are in six semester, you have seen this slide. Okay. So basically, a shock wave is a thin uh, front uh, across which you have properties change like pressure, temperature, density. Then Mach number ahead of the shock will always be supersonic. Behind the shock, uh, it becomes subsonic, normal shock. Of course, you have seen in an oblique shock, it need not be. Basic equations, we use a continuity momentum and energy equation. You solve that, you get a relation between the pressure before <coughs> or behind the shock to pressure ahead of the shock, uh, temperature, then density, so on and so forth. Okay. So what it does is it instantaneously increases the pressure, temperature and density across it. Okay. As I said, in air, generally it's an order of 10 power minus 7, 3 meters. So that means if I have pressure of 2 bar here and 1 bar here, so 1 bar per dp by dx, so 1 bar divided by 10 power minus 7, okay, that means it becomes 10 power plus 7 bar per meter, okay. So that means that's a kind of pressure gradient you have, okay, large gradients, okay, right. So what happens, <clears throat> the shock relations we have, everything increases, the pressure increases, the temperature increases, the density increases, but something has to change, isn't it? Because everything cannot increase because at the end of the day, uh, all of us know energy conservation principle, energy cannot be what? Extra you got somewhere, okay. What decreases is the total pressure, <coughs> the Mach number, okay. The velocity decreases behind the shock and the total pressure, that is the pressure loss, will be more, okay. So that's why we call it as a, a best uh, a mechanism to dissipate energy. Okay? So you will always, your total pressure will always decrease across a shock wave. Okay? So how do you generate shock waves? <clears throat> so we have what's called some conventional type shock tube, then innumerable types of uh, conventional shock tubes, then you have a diaphragm the shock tube, then you can do it by using uh, explosives, then inside the liquids and uh, 
the shock in solids that's called split, split of Kinson bar. So this is uh, <coughs> uh, the shock tube we had in my earlier university where I was working as if there are two of you, two students here, we have seen this. Okay. Uh, we created this facility. It's not being used to the fullest extent. Okay. So I think we have spent close to one crore to create this facility. Okay. So it's huge uh, uh, money uh, putting uh, for to create this facility, okay. We have everything except for a high speed camera, okay. Yeah, clearance setup we have. Everything is there, only high speed camera is not there. Once in a while we borrow it from ISD and use it, okay. Like whenever we want, because high speed cameras nowadays they have become cheap, but the cheapest one for this kind of work will cost you somewhere around 30 lakhs, okay. That's a, that's a minimum, right. So you get uh, around that. It's anything good ones you get into. You have seen now movies with 4K movies in uh, what is that? Slow motion, all action movies. Those cameras cost you somewhere around one crore. Okay, right? So they are very expensive. Okay, uh, depending on the resolution. For this, you don't require high resolution because all what we do is black and white. That's more than enough for us to do a scientific people. We don't require uh, your heroes. Uh, what is that? Slow motion to uh, see that. Okay. So, uh, but still. That kind of a resolution you get around 30 lakhs is what, 25 to 30 lakhs is what you normally require to get that. Other than that, <clears throat> it's uh, really incomplete, okay. So what our lab we have, we are struggling to run this because of that, okay. Right? The other one is the expenses that you require for heat transfer measurement, platinum thin gauges, and platinum you know it's quite expensive, okay, right. So uh, everything is expensive in this research okay i'll also show you the cheapest uh, shock tube we have i think it's not here yeah it is kept on this table okay it's removed here uh, yeah it's here okay right so that costed us thirty thousand rupees okay. so what is the conventional shock tube okay. so basically it's a very simple uh, device so very well one section on ice high pressure section and a uh, driven section and low pressure section uh, when you just open this bar from the high pressure gas gets into low pressure gas and it starts driving this garage and creates a shock front or a pressure front okay so that's how uh, you uh, get it it's like uh, you have in a cage a lion bring it here and open it the cage what happens okay all of you start running okay and building a pressure at, on the door it's same thing happens here okay so you have a high pressure gas just open it up instantaneously how instantaneous it should happen? So it should happen instantaneously, okay. So what is the order of uh, da from opening time? Normally we use aluminium foils, which aluminium plates, which open up, that's a most time tested one for the past 50 years. Uh, we have a mechanism of opening it, you score it, I think I don't have the image of a, uh, what is that, plate. You score it in a particular way, the glue length, glue thickness, all of them have been standardized, okay. By this time, they open up like pattern, four patterns, you get it. Okay, once it opens up, generally the uh, time what we have, people are able to measure is somewhere around one microsecond and less than one microsecond it takes to open up. So most of the uh, conventional uh, valves cannot give you that kind of a time to open up, okay. So we'll, I'll also show you an DAW from the shop view where we replace this. Nowadays we have valves, we don't no longer use um, the aluminium ones, okay. But the best strength shock you get even today, anywhere in the world, is from da from opening, okay. So with all the technology, still you go back to old one, where you open up a da from by itself because of the pressure you have. So this is the relation between the pressure at this point, this is called driver pressure P4, and the driven pressure is P1. So P4 by P1, so you get this where MS is the shock mark number and uh, it's a function of, uh, uh, the actually if you put it other way around, it's easy to remember, that's why we always write. The mark number you get is a function of driver pressure, the driven pressure and speed of sound in driver and driven, okay, A1 by A4. So the driver gases normally we use helium and nitrogen, driven gases are air and argon. So when I use helium in the driver gas, uh, still in the driven section we will always have what? Air because that's where our interest lies in any aerodynamics. 
So the shock should be in the air, not in the helium. Okay. So helium acts like a piston, driving, uh, compressing the air to create a shock. So why helium? Because you can just see that speed of sound is around one kilometer per second, whereas the nitrogen is 350 meters per second. So this ratio also becomes very important. So for the same ratio of nitrogen and air, uh, let's say you get, uh, you require a P4 by P1 of 40. If you use helium, it comes down to, let's say, 25. Okay. So that means your operating pressure should become less. So you normally have, you, depending on the design of your shock tube, you can go up to 100 bar or 30 bar, 40 bar. Okay. Normally we use around 40 or 50 bar in these things. Beyond that, it becomes very uh, unsafe. Okay. So the biggest, uh, largest pressure I have handled was around 50 bar. Okay. So that afterwards you start, I mean, <laughs> you know what happens to your heart, okay, right? Beyond that, you start panicking, okay, right? Even though they are safe. So nobody wants to take a risk of that, okay? Now, this is how, uh, uh, what happens in a, a shock tube when the driver gas rushes into driven section. So this is that point, we call it the XT diagram. So this is the shock front, which is moving in this direction. And there is a contact surface, and there is a reflection at the end, okay? So this was the original pressure in your uh, driven section. And behind the shock, this is P2, and this was a P4, what was the area, okay. So the temperature you can see has risen, and the pressure has risen, okay. This is a common uh, terminology we use. The driver pressure is called P4, driven section is called P1, then similarly T1 and T4, row 1 and uh, uh, row 2. So, and uh, row 5 is a reflected pressure, and uh, P5 is a reflected, T5 is a uh, reflected uh, temperature, okay. So this, I think, uh, six semester students, you have seen this figure, okay. I think I have shown you this figure, okay. So this is the same thing I showed them. So this is what is the uh, uh, laboratory for shockwave, hypersonic research, I was telling. This is the uh, photo taken at the earlier days of uh, shockwave research, uh, hypersonic lab. I think they shifted, I don't remember when it was shifted, 2015 or something. Earlier it was in a very small place, I'll show you that also. Uh, then they have shifted to this. And this looks very empty. Now, tomorrow, when Friday, when you go, you will see you don't even have space to stand. There are so many shock tunnels now. Okay. So there are only two I have shown. Uh, there are, I think, six of them like this. Then you have vertical shock views. So many things okay, happening there. Okay. I think Professor Arunan's shock view is here on this side. Okay. So this is the Rankine humanoid relations. I think six semester students, we have derived this. Okay. P2, P2 by P1. And P5, P1, what I did derive, because we didn't get time okay, to derive that on that day, okay, right in that class. So this is a reflected shock. So this is the primary pressure inside the driven section. So this is the pressure behind the shock, and this is the pressure behind the reflected. Okay. So where do you get the reflection? You get the reflection when you reach the end of the uh, tube. So your shock wave goes and hits this end uh, wall and comes back. Okay. If it is open, it just opens into the atmosphere. But uh, if it is closed, we normally should, uh, uh, it gets, so this pneumatic wall will be uh, sitting on this. So you have the boosters on the side. So when you open the pneumatic wall, it comes back and the air rushes from all these sides and enters into this. The biggest disadvantage is that the diaphragm opening time is a finite amount of time, unlike on the side, order of few microseconds, this will be around one millisecond, okay. So that means, uh, the shock strength, what you get, will be much lower than what you get from a diaphragm shock tube, okay. But the advantage is that, so once you take the shot, close this, fill up the air, take one more shot. And you open the uh, valve when you want, okay. Suppose you want a 30 bar, you can open at 30, 40 bar, you can open at 40. So that's the advantage of a diaphragm a shock tube, okay. So how does it work? So this is the shock tube where I started my work. And uh, this lab, uh, you can just see, congested, very old one, it was almost about to fall, okay. So when we, morning, when we go or evening, so when I was working, we used to go every day at five o'clock, like uh, Satyam Suhas was telling about my student, I was also doing, me and my friend, go at five o'clock, we used to stay up to nine o'clock at 9.30, every day, drive for 20 kilometers, go there and walk, okay. So that's how, uh, walk. So when our people, nobody was using this lab, not many people, so we had a room inside, so it was infested with rat and rat, uh, every day we have to clean that and do it. Okay. So now what you saw that LHS uh, was uh, 
really, really hard efforts of Professor Jagdish and KPJ. They have brought in more than 200, 300 crores. Okay. The entire lab is built not from ISD money, from their project money. Okay. Entirely. So that's how the Africa shock tubes work. Uh, you have a pneumatic uh, pressure reservoir. Okay. So this is a pressure reservoir you have. So this is a T joint where you just release uh, exhaust. Uh, any pneumatic, you have seen the pneumatic valves, isn't it? Just open it up, it comes out. So we have, uh, of course, we have designed our own pneumatic valve because we wanted to the piston to move as fast as possible. Normal pneumatic valves, so you have a pressure here. When you release this pressure outside, it starts moving. What we did is, we made sure that you have high pressure here and also a pressure here. This pressure difference is, we created a pressure difference between these two. When you open up, the pressure difference increases so that you accelerate that piston. So we have to devise our own uh, with that, um, piston cylinder arrangement, okay. Uh, not the part out items, okay. So once it rushes, then the shock starts transmitting, okay. Uh, this is how you measure the uh, shock speed in a shock tube. So you have different places your uh, 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 the pressure sensors. So you will have one pressure sensor here and one more here. Okay. So then uh, you uh, get the signal you acquire. So you know where the first point and the second point. So you know the pressure signal distance between these two. Uh, time what is taken from your uh, uh, pressure uh, signal. So the shock mass number will be delta S by delta T where delta S is the distance between these two points where you uh, had the pressure signal, pressure taps, divided by A1, speed of sound, will give you the shock mark number inside your shock tube. So that's the standard way you measure it. So uh, the one problem with uh, <coughs> uh, or the tap from the shock tubes you have is the repeatability question comes into picture. Even though you open at the same time, still you don't get repeated signals. So we are able to tune it uh, opening such that so you are able to get a repeatable P2 values. Okay. So these are four trials which are nearer to each other. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what uh, the schematic sketch of that uh, shock you. So these are the pressure ports you have. One, uh, one more, one here, one more somewhere on this side to measure the pressure. This is to evacuate the driver's side. Okay. Normally, as I said, uh, the driver to uh, the shock depends on P4 by P1, that is driver pressure to driven pressure. How do you increase the pressure ratio? You can increase P4 numerator or you can decrease what? P1 denominator. So what we do is we increase not only increase P4, we also decrease what? P1. Since of 1 bar, make it 0.1 bar. So have 10 bar to 1 bar, the ratio is 10. Make this as 0.1, so you have a 10 by what? 0.1, it becomes what? 100. So that's how you uh, play around to get a better shock mark number. But what is the uh, problem? your P2 values also will come down. So, what? Because the rise is P2 by P1, the rise is above what you have it in your shock driven section. That means your 1 bar, if P2 by P1 is 10, so you will get what? 10 bar. But if your P2 by P1 is, your P1 is 0.1, so same ratio for the same Mach number, but what you get is what? 1 bar. So that's, depending on your application, you should think of how to just manipulate these two, okay. It all depends on where you are using, what for you are using, okay, what application you are using, okay. So if you have just seen all the formulas are ratios, okay. So I can just manipulate whatever way I want. <clears throat> the ratio only depends on the <clears throat> gamma and uh, Mach number. The individual values don't depend, okay. So depending on what you have, you can <clears throat> So some of the experiments we did at the initial stage, so I just, as a sir was asking, um, so how do you, so we devised, uh, we wanted to see how a material deforms or how it uh, behaves for a shock, uh, in shock wave. So we, at the end of the shock tube, we had a, a fixture made so that I can put a metal plate uh, where, of course, the only drawback in this, we had not vented it out. So because when this gets deformed, the volume gets reduced when the volume gets reduced, what happens? The back pressure will be there. Okay. So, but the volume was so large and the change in volume was so small, so the pressure rise was very, very negligible. Okay. Normally, we can vent it out so that it gets comes out. Okay. So this idea gave us, I'll just show you one more application, how we, from one thing, you just move on to the other one. Okay. 
So this one, what Satyam Suhas was telling, he is the one who started, I mean, after I left all these things there, he started working on this and uh, you are just you are seeing what all the work he has done beyond that. Okay, this is basically how you deform a material. I think yesterday's talk you would have seen this. Okay, so I just don't want to get into that. I think this is, uh, a, of course, the other one is can you, uh, coming to simulation, okay, right? So can you simulate shock tube flows? It's very easy today to simulate shock tube flow compared to 15 years back or 20 years back. So you, it's very easy to do it in ANSYS and console uh, if you have. Console is much more easy compared to ANSYS. So this is what is done in uh, ANSYS. Okay. So I have my uh, uh, shock. So this is the shock moving. There is an expansion uh, moving behind. It goes, it goes on expanding. So this is the shock which is uh, moving in the front. Of course, this uh, an ANSYS, you know that you can have time delay and uh, just video. So it's not in the real time, okay, right. So this is the shock front which is moving and this expansion wave goes on moving on the other side. Whenever there is compression, there has to be what? Expansion on the other side, okay. So this is very easy to uh, simulate. What you have to do is you have to create two uh, patches on either side in a rectangle, one with a high pressure, other with a low pressure. Then do transient analysis you get. So you don't need to bother too much about number of elements also unless until you are trying to look at the, we have done that boundary layer effects, all that if you are looking then you require to refine your mesh and other things. Otherwise, you just want to know only this. You can also see the expansion wave. It came back, hit the end section, it starts coming up and it tries to catch us up with this. Before it catches up with this, your experiment should have been over. Okay? Otherwise, this creates a problem. I will show you other <coughs> um, one more video where we see what is the advantage of using this uh, expansion wave coming back. Okay. I think this one is uh, a small interaction with um, uh, with a, um, a stationary one. It's inclined, so this is called a reflection. Yeah. So the shock got reflected, and the reflected shock is much more stronger than the incident shock. You saw that P2 by P1. So now I have P5 by P1 now. So this is P5 what you have. Uh, of course, this was an inclined plate and not a vertical one. So that's why some of this is got leaked into the other section. Okay. So we did some work on that um, and did publications on that. Yeah. The next one is, so you saw one crore shock tube and this is a 30,000 rupee shock tube. Okay, right. Uh, so we had hand operated shock tube we created. I think uh, afternoon uh, Chintu will tell about uh, ready cube. Okay, so it's similar to that. It's much more, little more cruder way. And uh, because we didn't have money to own the entire shock tube, but it's made up of essence. So you have a driver section and a driven section, and there is a plunger inside this. So you push the plunger, and you have a um, diaphragm. So you can use aluminium foils, or the best way is paper. Okay, paper is your. Uh, Tracing paper, that's the best diaphragm you get. Even today, all over, we use tracing paper as diaphragms. So it's not, uh, it doesn't spoil your shock tube. Once in a while, what happens is this uh, diaphragms, uh, they open, they completely open, and those metallic pieces, what you have, they travel through this at a high velocity. They can just spoil the entire surface uh, inside your shock tube, okay? So that creates, a, whenever you have friction, you know, isn't it? Boundary layer will become what? Bad. So you don't want any boundary layer effects inside that. Okay. This is, I think, 28 mm. Yeah, no, 26.5 mm at tube uh, with a 0.3 meter uh, driver section and uh, 2 meter. This actually driver section is from here to here. This is a, called a booster type thing, okay? Because at the end, you require some of mass flow. So because it takes air, it, we don't have a compressor here. So no compressor to get high pressure, okay? So we have the entire pressure is obtained by hand. Okay. So you push the cylinder, you get. We went up to, I'll show you the person who got a 7.5 bar. Okay. Right. So you require a lot of muscle energy to get higher bar because your pressure will be what? Pushing you back. Okay. So you are able to get up to 7.5 bar of uh, pressure here. Uh, so then uh, around shock, 2.08 was our shock mark number maximum we got. So you can have a simple DSO and of course uh, current source and uh, other things, small things you require. And this was, uh, we used uh, pressure sensors, 
which was around 1500 uh, rupees, okay, pressure sensors, we are able to get a result. Okay. Are they accurate? They are not accurate. But if you are using it for an application where you only want to know what is the pressure, they are more than enough. Okay. So you want to know how the pressure profile looks, then you require. We also checked with our pressure sensors what we added to the shock tube, the piezo sensors, they cost you around 75,000 to 1 lakh for each sensor. We also used them and checked whether these pressure sensors are giving us the same peak value. They are able to get the same peak value, but their response time is, this is around 0.5 millisecond, their response time is 1 microsecond. Okay. So that's a, that's why the cost is 1,500 to 1, 1 lakh. Okay. So some of the, I think this video, I just, so this is the guy who had that energy to get a 7.5 okay. bar. <laughs> So this is a driver section and driven section. You can just see that um, we connected it to uh, the, a PC with uh, LabVIEW. We had a LabVIEW also. So these things you can so that you can get the pressure signals. Uh, he is explaining basically. Actually, we have given this to some competition. So the pressure signals you can acquire. So through LabVIEW. I think I can just skip that. Now they are using. No, we still we are using hand operated. No, only for this. The other one we have, we require a um, complex model. Yeah, exactly. So basically, what we do is, I think I'll just I didn't. Uh, uh, okay, okay. One second. I'll just show you what we normally do in a. Uh, yeah, you can see these cylinders here. So basically, these are either helium or nitrogen cylinders. So these are, we don't use a compressor because compressors don't give you uh, constant pressure uh, filling okay and uh, you don't get see the problem with all these uh, shock tunnels is uh, in a shock tunnel uh, the temperatures become very low when it starts expanding in a nozzle the temperatures can go as low as up to 77 uh, k or 100 k so 100 k is a very small temperature okay so minus uh, how much minus 200 degrees celsius is what the temperatures it can go if you have if you use air directly from your atmosphere, there is every chance that you will have droplets. Okay, so you require dry air. If it's a dry air, what we normally use, we use nitrogen because nitrogen and air have what similar properties. So that's why we use nitrogen or helium. Okay, so which is dry air. Other than these cylinders are connected to the shock tube. I think even you know, in the Amrita shock tube, uh, we had those cylinders. Let's go back. Yeah, you can see the cylinders. Yeah, these are the cylinders we have. Okay. These are nitrogen cylinders or helium cylinders we use right? to drive. Okay, not a compressor. Compressor we cannot use unless until you are a dryer. In um, shock tunnel, sorry, uh, wind tunnels they use hypersonic wind tunnels they use uh, uh, compressor, dry air. It's it's very expensive process. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so we uh, what we did is uh, we also played around with this uh, experiment. So we got from the open domain. Okay, now you just see the signal. It's not a shock signal. It looks like what a blast signal. Okay, so once a shock wave enters into open domain, it starts attenuating very fast and creates what a blast profile. So rather than what. A shock profile, okay, shock profile. So, so this gave us the idea of how to use a normal shock tube to create a blast profile. Okay. So, uh, I'll just go to that. So, some of the experiments we did on this are uh, what I have done: I'll do metal forming studies, then shock attenuation. How do you attenuate shock waves or blast waves using perforated plates, screens, so on and so forth? Then we had an interesting on biodiesel, which enhanced the uh, with the efficiency of the bio. Otherwise, the nanofluid stability of the nanofluids was enhanced. Okay. All of them resulted in uh, publications, which are either published proceedings in uh, notes in mechanical engineering from uh, Springer or AAP, American Institute of Physics, and IOP, Institute of Physics. Okay. I think from that 30,000 shock tube, uh, I had six or seven papers. I think my colleague Vinod also had few papers. Okay. So we have done at least some eight or nine 
good publications from that 30,000 rupee, uh, what is that? Shark cube. In fact, in fact uh, we have done, to be frankly speaking, that one crore shark tunnel compared to the number of publications we got from that, we have this more because uh, that we are not al allowing students, VTech students to use, when we don't allow them to use naturally, the work also does. This we allow them to use because it's cheap and anyway you can get okay something like that. So all these studies were done, a lot of other things were also done by using that. Now before I just move on to uh, the blast waves, uh, so it may not take much time. Yeah, another 10, 15 minutes, I'll just close it, okay? Uh, I just wanted to uh, tell you about shock reflections, refractions. See, shock behaves like uh, any light. It reflects, refracts, and transmits, okay? The amount of reflection depends on what we normally call an impedance. Impedance is rho into A square. Rho is the density of the medium. A is the speed of sound in the medium. So if you take A, uh, this is rho, and this is uh, A, and uh, a, rho into A square will give you this concrete, this one, sand, wood, snow, all that you have given, air, helium, snow, water. The amount of reflection depends on the mismatch between the impedance value. Suppose air, the shock in air comes in contact with concrete, so you can see a large impedance difference, 10 power 6 and 10 power 11, most of it gets reflected. Same thing if air, shock in air comes in contact with, let's say, water, the impedance mismatch is not so high. So a part of it gets transmitted, a part of it gets reflected. Okay. The amount of reflection depends on the impedance mismatch. Okay. Suppose you create a shock wave here, everything gets flows through okay, in the room because all of them, all entire uh, air in the room is at what? Same density. Suppose you have that corner, a high density air, high density uh, or high temperature air where A is larger. So you have a large temperature air there on this side. Then a part of it gets what? Reflected. Okay. So why is this important is, at the end, when you create a blast resistant uh, materials, so you should know how much gets reflected, how much gets transmitted, how much gets absorbed. Okay, absorbed. So I just, a recent paper, this is from Professor Jagdish, I, uh, I just saw it a few days back, okay. Uh, okay. We did try to model uh, shock reflection and refraction. Uh, long back I tried it. We were able to get the reflection. The refraction I was not able to do. Now I think I didn't have any uh, means to exp how did that, uh, verify that. Now we have means to do that, okay. So in a solid what happens is air to solid, you saw that there is a huge impedance mismatch. Whatever goes, it's that and gets reflected, okay, reflected. So whereas in water, not all that gets reflected, okay. So this is an experiment Jagdish and all have done in their lab. So you have an open end shock tube, like uh, you just saw. There is a water here. The shock, when it comes out, it comes out in a spherical form, not in a planar form. Once it comes out into open domain, it becomes a spherical shock because it starts propagating around, okay, around. So it's a part of it will impinge on this and uh, we'll see the results what we have. So you can see this, this is the incident shock. Uh, this is a reflection, we call R or regular reflection. And this is the refracted one. You can see this inside the water. This is water, this is air. So you can see here, one shock, small one, a refracted one. Once the uh, shock enters into water, it starts moving much faster than in air. Why? Because the speed of sound is what? Large, Mach number will be large in water. So it just, uh, you can go through this paper, your series of uh, uh, images like this, clear images, where you can see it just overtakes uh, the shock in air, okay, almost by two times, okay. So it just moves far faster, okay. So this is an interesting one to model now. Okay, I'll, I hope I'll try to do that, okay, to capture this. I have not, not done, I have not, never captured this. This I can capture, the reflection we can capture easily, but Refraction is not going to be easy. Hopefully, I'll try to model this uh, either using ANSYS or CONSOL. Okay. Then coming to shock tunnels. Okay. So what are shock tunnels? Basically, at the end of the shock tube, you create you have a nozzle. So for aerodynamic people, so this is what you require. Okay, right. So you require high speed uh, gas or an hypersonic or supersonic one. Okay. So depending on the nozzle. 
So LCD nozzle, so you can get hypersonic or supersonic. What for the shock tube is used? The shock tube is used to create, you have, you saw that previously, the shock goes, let's say, at Mach number point, uh, Mach number three. So you have a dark room here, which stops the shock, then you get what? Reflected shock. The reflected shock, you saw the pressure. So it was almost 51 bar, whereas for a Mach 3, 51 bar. So what? Uh, this 51 bar will become what is called P0, okay, your stagnation pressure. I think those who are in 6th semester know the velocity here depends on the stagnation pressure here. So you get the stagnation pressure. So it's temporarily stopped here. You have a slug of gas, which is at 51 bar, which enters, that is P0, enters into that, then starts expanding. And you, depending on the nozzle, remember, the diameter of the nozzle at this point determines the Mach number. So for one physical uh, nozzle, you can get only one Mach number. So you want a different Mach number, you require a different nozzle. That's one more problem with hypersonic research. Every Mach number, I require one nozzle. Each nozzle may cost you anywhere between one to two lakhs, okay? So you cannot have just like that, do. So everywhere, if you see uh, experimental research, people would have published, one lab would have published most of their research on Mach 6 or Mach 8 or Mach 5 or Mach 10, depending on what the facility they have, okay? That's what I said, the hypersonic lab has got Mach 8, Mach 10, Mach 5, I think Mach 4, all these nozzles are there, okay? So you don't get everywhere that. So this is a shock tunnel, okay? So you have that slug of gas passes through this, then you have a dump tank. What is the dump tank, basically? To dump it, okay? All this mass gets dumped here. Why? It should get dumped. If it doesn't get dumped here, it goes and hits this and reflects, and your model, what you have kept, will not be seeing only a, uh, what is that? A, a smooth flow. You start getting a reflected, a gas okay, reflected. So this generally we evacuate it to 10 power minus 8, uh, 10 power minus 5 millibar, that's 10 power minus 8 bar. Okay. So you require a vacuum pump. So these vacuum pumps are uh, high vacuum pumps. What the diffusion pumps we call, after 10 power minus 2 or minus 3 bar, you have to take out whatever you have your air, what is the predominant gas in air? Nitrogen. What you do is, you take out each particle of, sucking each particle of nitrogen and diffuse it into a liquid, okay? That liquid absorbs. So go on sucking out nitrogen and put it onto that liquid, it absorbs that liquid, okay? So that's how you get 10 power minus 8 bar. It's almost complete vacuum. Why do you require so much of vacuum? Just basically, you don't require so much because whatever this gas, when it enters, it should not raise the pressure inside this, okay? So this pressure should be still smaller than, I think those who are six semester people know, the nozzle Mach number depends on what? P by P naught, okay, right? So you either you increase P naught or you decrease P. So that P should be much smaller than whatever the gas comes. It's like volume, okay? You have large volume, in a small volume, still the pressure will not change much. Okay? I just wanted to, I got this photograph from uh, Jagdish uh, uh, chapter on experimental methods in shockwave research. Uh, you can see this, this hypersonic uh, shockwave science and technology reference. Uh, this is a series of, uh, it's around 500 page uh, book, where it rolled over what all the shock tunnels available and different labs have uh, uh, published their work on in this uh, uh, series, okay, book. So you can just, if somebody wants, I can give you it's not much of mathematics is there. So they have said what are the capabilities of each lab in around the world, okay? Different universities, okay? So one chapter is there from uh, uh, Sri Ram and Jagdish. And this is a photograph what he has put there. It's the first shock tunnel uh, in India. So I have seen this, okay? So lucky I have seen this in the old lab. Okay? We call it as HST1. <coughs> now I think they have various versions. HST5 they have. Possible, yeah, this is HST. The other way to get uh, uh, the shock tunnel is what we call the three piston shock tunnel. I showed you the Mach number three and six. With Mach number six, you are able to get 290 bar, isn't it? P5. So what we do here is, you have a piston, a large piston, uh, a gas is there, uh, you hold the piston by some means, release the piston, that piston accelerates and compresses this gas to a very high pressure. Then you have from here regular shock uh, tube, and it creates a large shock Mach numbers. Why you require this is, 
the conventional shock tube by P4, I said we can go up to only 50 bar. Okay. So 50 bar, you can get only 2.5, maximum 3 Mach number. I cannot get. Whereas here, you get a large pressure because you are compressing it yourself. Okay. Uh, and you can go up to 7 or 8. People have gone up to 8 Mach number inside the shock tube. 8 Mach number inside the shock tube will give you large enthalpies. All these days, I didn't talk about temperature. Once it expands, you know that T by T naught. Okay. That means your T also comes down. But in atmospheric conditions, you require what? Large enthalpies. How do you get enthalpies? Your T naught should be what? Large. So how do you get? By T5 by T1 or T naught by T also depends on the shock. Okay. One is that. Other one is heat the gas. So this is a P-piston shock tunnel. Okay. Mind you, this are these uh, pistons move around 200 meters per second. And even if it's half a kg, you can imagine the kinetic energy. Okay. So I, I remember there was one incident 10 years back in the aerospace in France. It came out of this. So you require a, a huge mass of uh, metal to stop that piston here. Okay. The piston came out, PS21 building, 100 feet it traveled, PS21 more building. Okay. Luckily nobody was there on this path. Okay. So that's a kind of kinetic, you can calculate okay, half mv square, even 1 kg piston. If V is 300 meters per second, you know kinetic energy, okay, what it will have. So that's the danger of using pre-piston shock tunnels, even though they give us large enthalpies, okay. The enthalpies, I think, yet they were able to get, it's gone up to up to 20 megajoules, that's a large one. So what does 20 megajoules give you? What is the temperature it can get you? T naught. Cp T naught, okay. Right. H is equal to what? Cp into T naught. What is Cp? Yeah. Right. So 1.003 or 1004, you can calculate, theoretically it gets you around 20,000 Kelvin you can get, okay. So that's the kind of temperature theoretically you can get, if you get around 25 megajoules, okay, right. So but normally this way, so I said pre-lander wave, pressure increases, then the pressure goes to negative phase. So in the positive phase, it softens your uh, buildings, it comes back once again, you feel that everything is over, but the negative phase is just completely destroys it, okay? It strips you off, okay? So positive phase, you don't see much destruction. The negative phase is what destroys, okay? Destroys everybody. The positive phase, when you feel that your lungs, everything would have become what? Weak. The negative phase, they rip apart everything, okay? What you have it in your body. That's an effect of a blast wave, what you normally have, okay? Right. So I'll just only go through one way of generating a blast wave. This a diagram we have seen with Jagdish one generation of micro bar. So we had a, uh, we started using this, it's called a nonal tube. I think you would have seen this tube when the buildings are brought down, systematic blasting of the buildings to, uh, what is that? Uh, demolition of the buildings, you have seen it in Cochin, Delhi, all that. So they all come down in a pile, isn't it? So you require to sequentially detonate each of those uh, explosive devices. How do you do it? They use this tube, okay. Uh, this is a tube, a polymer tube, it's 4 mm inside diameter, coated with explosives. I think yesterday, Dr. Uh, Krishnan showed you this also. And the beauty of this is, after, uh, I think we calculate around 56 mm of the length of the tube, the detonation front, that's a shock front, always travels at 2.1 kilometers per second, whatever may be the length. Okay? Even if it's 1 kilometer long, the uh, speed is what? constant. That's why they are able to see, calculate the length of your cable. So you know what should be ignited at what seconds. So put so much of length of the cable. So they all ignite in a sequence so that a building collapses in a particular uh, manner. So we are able to get hold of this and use this for creating a blast wave at the end of this. Okay. So this was the igniter. So these are the, uh, uh, what is that, shock in the open domain. Okay. What you get. I'll just show you this video. So you can see the combustion gases coming out first, then the shock comes, shock is moving in the fast, then this is the combustion products of combustion coming out. Okay. So the energy of this blast wave, we were able to this is a device what it we had. This is a normal tube, polymer tube, I called it as. And uh, these are the metal foils. It's the same thing like what I showed. It's a bigger shock tube, and this is a smaller shock tube. And the velocities are very large compared to there, and peak pressures are very large. So when I uh, do this, 
anything I have on this will get accelerated. Okay, so we have dry particles on this drug. We just took a tablet and powdered it and coated it here and just blasted it. It was able to penetrate into the skin. Okay, right. You can see the peak pressures. So this is actually scale distance was a peak pressure. So we were able to get around 150 bar. Okay, so on the normal tube, that's a huge. But you can see the time scales. Very very small. Okay. So this is approximately almost 10 power 13 to 10 power 6. That is 30 microseconds. Okay. So the peak lasted for very few uh, microseconds. Okay. The total energy actually uh, depends on the area under this curve. I didn't give you that formula. The impulse, what we call, and the energy depends on the area under the curve. Okay. So this is the reflected pressure. What you have, the peak reflected pressure. These formulas are you are P2 by P1, or P5 by P1. Okay. So we also did, this is the pressure pulse, and this is the velocity, and this is the deflection you have. So see the pressure pulse comes and hits, and your metal is very slow to respond, okay. Let's go through that. Uh, yeah, can I use my uh, shock tube uh, to generate blast waves? We also did an experiment to generate blast wave inside that 30,000 rupee uh, shock tube, okay. Right. So we were able to generate. So this is the simulations what we had, and this is the experimental result. You can see this is the uh, signal we got, the blue one, signal we got at a distance of 3.95 meters from the diaphragm, and this is the pre-lander one. I said that formula we were able to re superimpose and get, see, we can get a similar one. And this is the uh, dependency of the driver pressure and the length at which you start getting a blast. You can see here, this is the shock wave. Okay, so slowly as it moves, at some distance, it becomes what? A blast wave with both negative and positive phase. Okay. So that tube was able to do so many wonderful things. Then shock waves in liquids. So this is a liquid. Uh, I think yesterday, uh, Jagdish was talking about that wound dealing one. They had a piston inside in, in, a, in which you have a liquid, isn't it? So basically, all these ideas uh, have similar origin. Okay, right? So this is a shock tube from uh, Skews, which is in. Uh, uh, South Africa, he has done a lot of work on liquid shock tubes, uh, his lab. So they have a, a piston, high pressure gas. You drive a piston, it comes and hits on the top of the liquid, then a shock starts propagating inside the liquid. It's like you throwing a hammer uh, into water surface, then a shock will start propagating. Okay. The only difference here is the hammer should not be allowed to pass through this. So you have somewhere here to hold the it's difficult to do this practically. It's not so simple as this because this piston is accelerating, comes and falls on the water, and you have to stop it. Okay, you should not allow it to what continue. So you have to catch it. Okay, so there are a lot of technical uh, details and mechanical problems. So this is a signal what we get in a shock in a liquid. In a liquid, generally it looks like a blast signal rather than a shock, and the times are very small. Okay, right. in a solid, these peak pressures will be in gigapascals. But the durations will be entire duration will be less than one two microseconds. Here it's around 50 microseconds. There it comes down to one microsecond. Okay, but the peak pressures will be what large. Okay, large. Uh, the shock waves in solids. How do you generate shock waves? We call it a split Hopkinson bar. You have a driver bar which comes and hits the driven bar. A section is this. When it then it just propagates a shock wave here. Okay, I'll not get into the details of this. And now uh, so this is the. Uh, the rising, uh, I think, uh, stress inside this. So it's in a 0.2 microseconds. Your stress has gone up to 20 kilo bar. Okay, like KSI. So inside the bar, because you have that, in just 0.2 microseconds, the stress levels have increased so much. Okay, right, using that, I think I stop. Thank you. Thank you. So we are right on time for lunch. <laughs> The shock profile uh, does not remain same actually. Uh, they take the characteristic of the medium in which they travel. So they will not remain same. So in a, in a A, let's say you have a larger duration of uh, peak pressure. Once it enters into water, that becomes narrower. Yeah, because a part of it gets reflected. It's a total energy has to be same. So whatever reflected, what gets transmitted only will have. The amount trans get transmitted will depend on the impedance. You can calculate actually.
Uh, what should be the ratio between the length of the driver and the driver? Ah, yeah, okay. That I didn't uh, give you the details. Uh, generally, uh, uh, D by L, uh, the, the length of the driven to the diameter of your shock tube should be somewhere around 75 to 100. 75 is what normally we do. Anything 50 also is okay. Less than 50, what happens is uh, the reflections will come back fast and catch you up with your shock from the other end. So generally, it should be above 50. In practice, we use 75 is what normally we use. Now, the length of the driver gas, that depends on what is the volume of gas you want. That also has a bearing on what is the length of your driven section is. And what's the, with the hand head, how much was the mark speed? Two, mark speed. Even the big one also, we get around mark three, that's all okay, because otherwise it's not difficult to, otherwise your P4 should be large. It's not the mark number, it's also the intensity, okay, and the slug of mass you are getting for your hypersonic study. Anyone else has any questions? So what, uh, can we replace the diaphragm by, by any other means? Yeah, we saw the diaphragm less one. No, like, uh, well, like generally if we keep any metal sheet, it will burst off. So mm -hmm. other than pneumatics and uh, that, that normal metal diaphragm, can we replace it by any other means? I have not come across with anything. It, it's basically... Carbon fiber as they you know, the diaphragm. No, you, you can... At the end of the day, you should uh, allow the gas in the driver section into the driven section as instantaneously as possible. That's all is your... One way is you have a blast, okay, a cracker or a TNT. Take TNT and just ignite TNT. That's a probably the easiest way to get a huge shock, okay. But of course, you cannot do that. Okay? People have tried uh, using explosives, explosive driven shock tubes, I didn't show you. There are explosive driven shock tubes. Okay? They are not easy to handle. Okay? I think all of us cannot handle them. Okay? That's uh, very dangerous. They also require a lot of permissions, all that. Okay? Sir, any safety precautions or policies are made in India or anywhere in the world? Because it is now it's open. It's, it, it's basically, to be frankly speaking, there are no safety guidelines to operate these anywhere. So it is what we normally do on ourselves. We had accidents, I don't want to get into the details of those accidents. Um, see the cylinder what you have, we had mounted it on a trolley something. Okay. Why did we mount on a trolley is, by chance the cylinder hose comes out. Yesterday you saw a dish blew a, what is that? Balloon and left it, okay. Suddenly, what happened? It just slide around. The cylinders also fly around. Okay. We had accidents like that. If they fall, if they fall accidentally also, they just fly around. We have seen accidents like that. Luckily, damages have not happened so much, but you can see a cylinder of so much height, uh, maybe around 50, 60 kgs flying around with that kind of velocity on your floor. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's really difficult in the sense, once you get used to that, you follow uh, SOP, okay, standard operating procedures, you can uh, always get that. I think it's getting recorded, isn't it? Is there any ACE in standards? I don't want to talk about certain, <laughs> certain incidents which uh, is there any ACE should not be talked about outside. Is there, is there any ACE in standards might expect from your side? You can close the recording. <laughs>